Hi, I'm Brian Dacus, president and founder of the Pacific Justice Institute. Welcome to Faith and Law. Now let's take a look at this latest trending viral video. Kurtulsanız, vicdan azabından kurtulamayacaksınız. Vicdan azabından kurtulsanız, tarihin azabından kurtulamayacaksınız. Tarihin azabından kurtulsanız, oh. Allah'ın azabından kurtulamayacaksınız. Oh. Hepinizi saygıyla okay. selamlıyorum. A legislator. A legislator saying those things. Well, folks, this should be very disturbing uh, to anyone out there who respects human rights, and particularly the nation of Israel and their right to self-exist. Uh, here we have the Hamas out of Gaza doing this hideous massacre. And do we hear uh, politicians from Turkey or other Islamic countries openly condemning it? saying this is outrageous, this is terrible. No, their silence is deafening. But in addition to silence, we do have people like this legislator from Turkey out there uh, justifying the hideous, brutal, inhumane, barbaric acts of the Hamas. Well, let us take note, folks, that this legislator he is a legislator in Turkey. Turkey is a member of NATO. Um, this is supposed to be an ally of the West, an ally for freedom and liberty and et cetera, et cetera. So this should be very disturbing that a member of NATO has politicians uh, openly justifying terrorist organizations and actions by the likes of Hamas and condemning Israel and their right to self-exist. You know what's also interesting to note about this, though, is the fact that this legislator died two days later, just died, heart attack. Now, many people out there are saying, was this God? I don't know if this was God striking him dead for openly condemning and cursing the nation of Israel. I don't know if, if that was God just striking him dead as an example. Don't openly uh, go against the people of Israel, go against the nation of Israel. But it could have been. And what, at the very least, what we need to glean from this is a reminder that God is not dead. God is living. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God who formed the universe is all around us, his truth will not remain void. His righteousness will not be defeated. And his promises to the people of Israel and his covenant to Israel also is still intact. Well, speaking of parents' rights to discipline their children and to raise up their children, uh, we have something interesting taking place in the state of Texas. The state of Texas Board of Education has been adopting some policies that are going out of their way to put parents first, to be respectful of parents and parents' rights and how they raise their children. Uh, to help discuss this, I'd like to bring onto the program now a member of the Texas State Board of Education, Julie Pickren. Uh, Julie, welcome to the program. Hi, Brad. It's wonderful to be with you in Pacific Justice Institute today. And thank you so much for everything you're doing in the great state of Texas and around the nation. Now, Julie, as you know, we at Pacific Justice Institute, we're committed to defending parental rights all throughout the United States. It's, it's very important to us as an organization. And we do it in the courts, but we're also actively involved in supporting people like you that are making a real difference in the state legislatures and in the state boards of education. Uh, you've been actively involved recently in a number of different ways uh, to further the rights of parents. Uh, could you uh, just uh, share with us what you're doing to help further the rights of parents in the state of Texas? You know, parental rights has been a very big issue in Texas, and it's been a very big issue around the nation. You know, but whenever we talk about parental rights, we have to start with what is the truth about parental rights? And the truth that we know about parental rights is what the Bible says, what God says about parents. 
And what God says about parents is that the family is the cornerstone of society. The family is so important to our culture, to our community, to our state, and to our nation. So therefore, we must do everything we can to protect parents' rights. You know, in Psalm 127, the Bible says that children are a blessing from God. And when the Bible was telling parents that children are a blessing, the Bible was talking to parents. The Bible was not talking to the government. But what we have right now in our nation and even in our state is we have elected officials from the federal level to the state level to the local level that honestly believe and that say children belong to the government and the government knows what's best for our children. And we know that's not the truth. We know that's not correct. But we have to look at it, or at least I look at it in the area of education. Whenever I see local school districts and even different states mandating mental health policies for students, mandating physical health policies, bringing in mental, mental health counselors and providers into their schools and bringing physical health, actual health clinics into schools, fully functioning working health clinics into schools. You know, whenever I see that, which that can be a good thing, right? But whenever I see that coupled with a belief from the people who are legislating this, the people who are passing the policies that children belong to the government, where do the parents fit in that? If you're bringing a full functioning health clinic or you're bringing in a full functioning mental health facility into a school, where are the parents' rights? How is the parent supposed to know what mental health treatment or what prescriptions or what vaccine or what uh, physical treatment their child is receiving when everything is happening inside of the school and the state is running it or the local government is running it? So, you know, this is an area of concern that parents really need to stand up and talk with to their elected officials and work with great groups like Pacific Justice Institute to really make sure that parental rights are observed and are protected at all area of the child's life. Please always remember, especially if, if any of our policy people are listening or elected officials are listening, they are the parents' children. There are students, but they are children of the parents, and the parents' rights are very important. Now, Julie, uh, you have been very outspoken with regards to your convictions, your faith, uh, your position on saving preborn babies from being aborted. You're very strong in your convictions. But how have those convictions influenced you with regards to legislation and, and policy measures that you've taken in your capacity as a member of the Texas State Board of Education? You know, Brad, I have been outspoken about my faith because I'm a Christian before I'm anything. I'm a Christian wife, a Christian mother, a Christian business owner, a Christian elected official. It's who I am. And so, you know, uh, my pro-life beliefs are really one of the core reasons why I serve in education and why I have served in education for many years now in the great state of Texas. Because as a Christian, I believe in the sanctity of life. And we see abortion happening disproportionately in the poor areas and a lot of minority areas around the state of Texas. And so, Addressing my pro-life beliefs, if me as a Christian and elected official and as a mom and a wife and a business owner, if I am going to represent policies or advocate for policies that say that every, right, every child has a right to be born, then we have to look at the areas where abortion is happening. And abortion throughout this nation is happening in very poor areas and a lot in minority areas. And so if we are going to say that every child has a right to be born, then we must be prepared to provide every child with a great education. Because education is one of the great equalizers in our society. Throughout America, education is what says it doesn't matter where you were born, who you were born to, what area, what economic class. 
education is key to the American dream. Okay, now many people around the country sort of have this impression that Texas is sort of this safe place where parents don't have to worry about having outrageous indoctrination, um, material in the curriculum that parents will find offensive. Oh, this is the state of Texas. This is, this is God's country. Well, you've actually seen something quite the contrary, haven't you, with regards to the curriculum and the instruction there in the state of Texas, right? So, Brad, it's interesting whenever you go through instructional materials approval and review process. Uh, you know, recently at the Texas State Board of Education, we reviewed science instructional materials, kindergarten through 12th grade. We also re reviewed personal financial literacy um, materials submitted for review and approval from the Texas State Board of Education. And honestly, Brad, I was, I was shocked at what was submitted. You know, it's kind of funny. They always say whenever you're, you're talking to somebody, remember your audience. Keep in mind who your audience is. And obviously, there were a lot of national publishers that forgot that they were submitting instructional materials to the great state of Texas. And so, uh, golly, I, just a few things that were just shocking to me that were submitted. Uh, an economics course. So, you know, a command economy is kind of the new label for communism. We're seeing it a lot in education. It's been in our uh, colleges and universities for a while. But I don't think that mainstream America refers to communism as a command economy. Well, what we saw in our economics textbooks that were submitted was it was teaching or was going, it was trying to, we didn't let it pass. Uh, it was going to teach our students, almost 6 million children in the great state of Texas, that a communist economy, a command economy, is the most benevolent form of an economic system. And so if you know anything about history, there's almost 100 million people that died at the hands of communism in the 20th century. I think that's almost 100 million people that would say that communism is not a benevolent form of an economic system. And so that was one thing that was submitted that we did not approve. Um, another submission uh, that was uh, submitted to us was in a childhood development course. And this particular childhood development course was going to teach uh, that children are sexual beings from birth. Think about that for a minute. A child as a sexual being from birth. And then it walked through the stages from birth to five years old on how to manually, it's, it's gross. I don't want to say it, it's disgusting. But anyways, it, it was going to teach high school students. So think about this. It was going to teach high school students, 16, 15, 16, 17 year olds, the sexual needs of an infant, okay? So it's so disgusting. I don't even wanna go into that, but praise God, um, it did not pass. We did not approve it. It is not in the great state of Texas. Now, Julie, what are some of the challenges you see taking place in Texas or the rest of the country for that matter? with regards to uh, education and parental rights, and how can we get ahead of this fight? You know, Brad, we've been doing really great things in the state of Texas in education and parental rights, but there are challenges on the horizon. There are definitely challenges ahead of us. You know, one of the main things is really focusing on parental rights is when you look at children in a household, you may have a child that really thrives and does well in public education. You may have another child in the same household that needs a very small classroom and more attention and needs to be in a private school with a smaller classroom size and more one-on-one -on -one attention. And then even in the same household, you may have a child that really needs the flexibility of some type of homeschool program. So this is where we really need to focus, at least in the great state of Texas and in many states around this nation, on true parental rights where parents decide, where parents decide what is best for each of their children with education. You know, we saw Florida on the, the national report card is, um, is a bipartisan, uh, just data-driven report card of states and education throughout the nation. We saw Florida, before they went to this model, they were around the mid-20s to 30s, 
on ranking throughout the nation. And now Florida in 2023 went to number one on the national report card. And I really believe that the reason why their students are doing so well in advancing is because every parent has the right to choose what education is best for their children. And now, you know, I'm a proud Texan, Brad. You know, there, there's only a handful of things that I love more than the great state of Texas. So for me to talk about Florida being number one in education is tough for this Texan. But I, I know that Texas is going to get this right. The parents in Texas have spoken. The governor has spoken. A lot of elected officials have spoken. And I know that Texas will get this right and truly observing parental rights that parents know what is best for each of their children or what is best for their child and what course of education is best for their child. Well, Julie, thank you so much for what you're doing. I know it was a real privilege and a blessing for our organization to be able to work with you, to partner with you, to support legislation that will allow chaplains to be on public school campuses all across the state of Texas. And it was a privilege to participate, to see that become law, and now being actually implemented in a number of school districts there in the state of Texas. Uh, thank you for the great work that you're doing, and we look forward to working with you in the future. So we have a case in the state of Texas being headed up by our attorney out of our Houston office, Emily Cook, that's involving defending religious freedom. It's involving specifically defending a Christian woman who worked for Intuit, and she was fired for a number of different events reflecting back on her religious freedom. And to help talk about this case, I'd like to bring on now Emily Cook. Emily, this is an interesting case where a Christian woman is fired not because of just one event involving her faith and convictions, but about actually several events. Can you talk about this case you're right, Brad. We have a plaintiff named Christina Watson. Um, we have filed suit in the Eastern District of Texas, the Sherman Division, and um, her, she, she was a design and marketing uh, senior designer uh, in the marketing department for Intuit. And over the last three years, the workplace has become an increasingly hostile place for Christians. It started with the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, religious exemptions, and um, we, we have sued um, on behalf of Ms. Watson uh, for retaliation, um, that her workload was diminished, that she was treated differently. Uh, despite her successes at Intuit, she was taken off projects that um, um, she had been on and led successfully, and her workload was pretty much diminished to zero. Uh, more, more recently, uh, she was terminated uh, pursuant to a pronoun policy. Uh, so Intuit over this past summer in 2023 uh, instituted the, their diversity, equality, and inclusion policy, DEI, that you see routinely. And this policy uh, required employees to use preferred pronouns for any of their colleagues that wish to be called uh, pronouns for something other than their biological sex. Uh, Miss Watson requested a religious exemption um, from this because of her belief that God made men and God made women and he does not make mistakes and you do not get to choose that that decision belongs to God. Now, Emily, I know this Christian woman is not alone. We're hearing more and more reports of open hostility by companies, large companies, against people of faith in the workplace. And the question I know that many people are asking themselves is, you know, should I stay working for a company like this that's hostile and be a, a salt and a light? Or should I just jump ship and move on to something else? What wisdom do you have as an attorney and what you've seen? Um, what wisdom do you have to, to give to someone right now working through that kind of an issue as a Christian in the workplace? The short answer to that, Brad, is no. Um, we are seeing mental anguish and the physical manifestations of that mental anguish time after time, case after case, plaintiff after plaintiff um, with Christians who are in these hostile workplaces where they're ramming down the throats of Christian employees, these DEI policies and random liberal policies that have no connection to the workforce, um, but are antithetical to the Bible and to the teachings that Christians um, seek to live out every single day. So if you can get out, get out. You don't need to be a martyr. These companies, if enough Christians leave, they will change their tune. So Emily, can you share your thoughts and opinions about uh, these DEI policies and also what they effectively forced 
your client to do? These DEI policies do the complete opposite of what they're intended to do. Um, they're actually very uh, discriminatory towards anyone with a different belief. It's very ironic that these are supposed to be policies that include everyone and foster a, a, a culture of, of communication and understanding and diversity. But if you disagree with any of those policies, there's no room for that type of diversity. Um, and, and it's just sanctioned yeah. discrimination is what it is. This DEI policy forced the termination of my client um, because she wasn't going to use preferred pronouns for an individual of some hypothetical ind individual in some situation hypothetically down the line. Now, Emily, I know this case was just filed there in the state of Texas, but how do you think it's going to end up? Hopefully we'll be able to settle some of these things through um, mediation on the pronoun issue, but I do believe the pronoun issue is probably a case of first impression. Um, that is that, that is something new that is circulating in companies and employees are just now being denied religious exemptions for that. And so there's not a lot of um, case law going on, but um, if we do get to uh, in the throes of litigation, uh, then we could probably expect an appeal to the Fifth Circuit from one side or the other, because this is a massive company and it's a big, big deal um, for the liberal companies. Um, they want to see these you, to, you and I to be forced um, you and I to be forced to call anyone what they want to be called that day. And if not, uh, we suffer very, very bad consequences. So that's my projection. Well, Emily, thank you so much for the great work that you're doing on this case and the other cases that you've taken on for people and groups there in the state of Texas defending religious freedom and parental rights and the sanctity of human life. Well, folks, we're actually taking on a lot of cases right now defending religious freedom, parental rights, and the sanctity of human life all across the country. We have 36 offices now in 29 states, coast to coast, defending uh, these basic fundamental rights that we have that are God-given and respected in our Constitution. And you know how we're able to do that? We're able to do it because of people out there like you who become a part of our team. And let me tell you, this monthly support is super important because that's what allows us to really have an understanding of what we have in the way of resources to make the commitments to take on more cases, to allow our attorneys to take the next till and the next till and the next till with confidence, knowing that that ammunition is coming in the form of monthly support from people like you. Well, folks, we're actively involved with the legislatures, dealing with laws and policies. We're actively involved in the courts across the country. But let's not forget that this involvement is all predicated on the foundation of God's Word, what it has to say about parents' rights, religious freedom, and sanctity of human life. So let's take a look at the Word of God and what God's Word says about fearing the Lord and the importance of taking Him and His Word seriously. It's in Proverbs 28, 14, it says, Blessed is the one who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. We need to remember that our God is an awesome God, a powerful God, a very loving God, but a very powerful God. And we're wise as believers to take his word seriously. You know, so many times I hear people you know, they say they're Christians. Oh, yeah, I prayed the prayer to receive Jesus, my Lord and Savior. And then they go off and they support things that go completely against God's word. They support candidates that push a radical agendas in our public schools that undermine parents' rights and push doctrines and ideology and teachings that go completely against the moral instruction of God's word. Folks, we, we can't serve two masters. We need to respect the Lord, not just as our Savior, but also as our Lord, and to put Him first. And what happens to people who don't acknowledge the Lord and put Him first in their lives, but instead go off and do their own things, whether as a believer or a non-believer? Well, it says, but whoever hardens their heart, hardens their heart, that is, to God's Word and respecting God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. Folks, a lot of the trouble we face is because we don't respect God in his word, in his, his counsel, his wisdom, his instruction, which is given to us out of love. Instead, we go our own ways, and we suffer because of that in so many ways in our society today. 
We have people who are suffering from a lot of issues, uh, medical issues, financial issues, opportunity issues, that go back to decisions that involve people choosing not to follow God and his word, but instead following something else, whether it's the breakdown of the family, uh, whether it's uh, criminal prosecution, or, or whether it's just uh, other ways that indirectly impact us because we don't follow what God's word says. Well, let this be a reminder to all of us that our God, our loving God is a powerful God and he will discipline and we need to put him first as a God who wants what's best, not just for us, but also what's best for the world and for those around us. Another important verse dealing with parents and parental rights is Ephesians 6, 4. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Notice it doesn't say public school districts uh, do not provoke your children to anger. A lot of school districts out there and people in public education, a teacher's union, they say, they say, these are our children. No, they're not your children. These children, according to God's word, um, are under the jurisdiction of their parents. And God gives a responsibility to parents to parent their children correctly in love, but also with discipline and instruction from the Lord. Let this be a reminder as parents not to take the instruction that God has given us over our children lightly. It's a responsibility from on high, from God. And let us also speak out and be bold against those institutions, including governments and school boards and, and public schools and others who wish to undermine in any way this important God-given right that he has given to parents and families throughout the world and in specifically throughout the United States of America. So folks, just remember this. No matter what we face, no matter what the challenges we're dealing with today, always, always keep the faith. <music>